So have you ever been watching a movie in the cinema and you're sitting through the credits waiting to see if there's an end credit scene and you watch all those names go by, first for the director and all the cast, then the crew, the second unit, the VFX artists, then all the catering staff and the legal department, and the production babies who, let's be honest, didn't even put that much work into the movie. And after all the music and the copyright information for every single brand name that was scarcely visible in one of the shots, the credits finally end with a whole bunch of logos. Well, have you ever wondered what these logos actually mean? What do they represent? And why does it seem like some of them are in every film ever? Well, today I'll be explaining those logos, what they mean and what they represent. Also, you should probably subscribe. Thanks. So let's start things off with a pretty common one. This logo here, the MPAA number, or now just the MPA number. If you're in the US, you probably also see this logo before a trailer plays on either a green or a red card for the green band and red band trailers respectively. This is the logo for the Motion Picture Association of America, the organization made up of all the major film studios that's responsible for providing age ratings for any film releasing in the United States. When that film is approved by the MPAA and receives a rating, it also gets given an identifying number, and that's what gets displayed along with the logo in the end credits. So for example, MPAA number 32381 is the 1993 movie Dazed and Confused. What's interesting to note is that the numbers given actually denote the order in which films were rated by the MPAA. So Dazed and Confused was the 32,381st movie to be given a rating. The first ever movie to receive a rating was of course given MPAA number one, and that was the 1934 movie The World Moves On. The term pre-code refers to sound movies released before The World Moves On, which often had grittier, more violent, or just less clean cut subject matter than the movies of the late 30s. While getting a film approved isn't explicitly compulsory, most American movie theaters will refuse to show unrated films, resulting in a de facto requirement. Most countries have their own version of the MPAA that provides their own rating system, such as the BBFC in the UK. But even in these countries, you often still see the MPAA number in the credits due to the fact that most major distributors and studios are American. A movie's got to be filmed with something, right? And would you believe it? Most of them are. These are all logos of companies that make and supply high-end movie cameras and lenses to film studios. ARRI are a very popular supplier of cameras and lenses. Nowadays they make most of the digital cinema cameras used in the film industry, most notably the ARRI Alexa line of cameras. They also still supply a variety of film-based cameras in both 16 and 35mm formats. Another popular name is Panavision, who have their own line of film and digital cameras, as well as a multitude of other equipment, like cranes, stabilizers, tripods, all of that camera adjacent stuff. And RED is a company that produces a line of digital cameras, both available for rental and also for purchase, many of which are slightly more accessible, so while there's no hard and fast rule, you'll see them quite frequently in lower budget movies. In the same vein as cameras, if your movie is shot on film, then the type of film used is often credited, as well as the lab in which the film was processed and the type of colouring system that was used, for example, Technicolor or Deluxe. Different audio tracks need to be designed when a movie is edited for stereo formats, 5.1 surround sound, or whatever other audio format the filmmakers might want to use. When you're watching a movie in the cinema, different theatres might use different setups too. Often some form of surround sound, where there are several speakers placed in specific locations around the room, but stereo sound, where there's simply a left and right speaker, might be used in some smaller theatres. There are a bunch of different systems and technologies for these audio formats, so it's common to see more than one audio logo at the end of a film. The two most common companies you'll see are Dolby and DTS. You can think of these as the main competitors to one another, with their own proprietary formats and technologies. Technologies. Dolby's formats include Dolby Digital, Dolby 5.1 Surround Sound, and Dolby Atmos. Whereas you'll most commonly see the DTS logo associated with DTS Stereo and DTS X. There are plenty of other sound formats too, including Datasat Digital Sound, Oro 11.1, and Sony Dynamic Digital Sound. There's also the famous THX, although it's worth noting that THX isn't a sound format specifically, but rather a quality control system that ensures that the sound you're hearing in the movie theater is as close to the sound the audio engineer heard as possible. Lastly, there's companies like Skywalker Sound who produce sound effects, sound design, and mixing for the movie itself. The film industry, particularly the one in the United States, is a heavily unionized business, 
So most movie credits also include the logos of whatever unions were associated with that production. A very common one is IATSE, that's the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Moving picture technicians, artists and allied crafts of the United States, its territories, and Canada. Because Iat Semptak Tut Sik would be a bit of a mouthful. They're a union for various technician and artist type roles across film and TV, as well as other entertainment areas like theatre and concerts. Another union is the Screen Actors Guild, which in 2012 merged with the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists and is now seen in film credits as SAG AFTRA. They represent actors and other on screen performers. The Directors Guild of Canada is a union that represents directors as well as editors and some other roles in Canada, and the International Brotherhood of Teamsters is a more general labour union that has a film division. You might also recognise some of these logos representing particular locations that a movie's been made in. But these logos aren't just there for showing off a filming location, nobody's shouting from the rooftops that their film was made in Georgia. Sorry Georgia. No, there's a reason why these same logos show up so often, and that's… well that's money. Georgia, Florida, New York, Quebec, Victoria. These are just some of the places that offer some kind of tax credit, grant, or some other form of financial incentive to studios to encourage productions to come to their area and generate economic growth. Here in the UK, we have things like the British Film Commission and the BFI Film Fund, which provides tax relief based on how British your film is, meaning how much of it's filmed in the UK, if the studio is British, if the cast and crew are British, but also things like whether the film is set in the UK or whether the plot is culturally related to Britain. If you're interested in finding out more about film incentives, Austin McConnell has a great video talking about the show Ozark, why that was filmed in Georgia instead of Missouri where it's set, and the wider world of Missouri film incentives. Computer software plays an ever-increasing role in film production, usually during post-production, but sometimes at other stages too. Adobe is often credited, as they have multiple pieces of software that are frequently used. Premiere is a very common editing software outside of the film industry, but is becoming more common in big productions such as the movie Deadpool. The VFX software After Effects and the image editing software Photoshop might also be used. But much of the film industry still relies on Avid Media Composer, which is the closest you'll get to an industry standard video editor. So you'll see this logo quite a lot, and when it comes to 3D animated movies, you'll typically see the logo of whatever animation software the movie was made in. Sometimes this is the Autodesk program Maya, DreamWorks has their own software Primo, and Pixar uses their own proprietary software called Presto. Pixar also make their own rendering software called Renderman, which you'll see in Pixar and non-Pixar movies alike. Lastly, here's a collection of other logos I thought were worth mentioning which don't fall into a specific category. Walt Disney Records and Warner Records are both examples of record labels that release the soundtrack to the movie, so you'll sometimes see their logo in the credits to basically advertise that to you. Speaking of advertising, it seems that in the credits to the original Toy Story, they advertise the Toy Story video game too, as if the credits of Toy Story are where you're going to find out that there's a Toy Story video game, and lots of live action movies include the logo of American humane, to show that that organisation has monitored animal welfare during production, which is where you'll see the certification that no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. So there you have it, an overview of all of those logos that you see in the end credits of a movie. This is by no means a comprehensive list of all logos in all movies. That sort of a video would be near impossible to make, but I've still tried my best to include as many of the most common ones as I could. I should also say that just because I've included a piece of software or equipment in this video, it doesn't mean that I'm trying to suggest that that's the only way that filmmaking is done. There are hundreds of different ways of achieving the same end goal, I just haven't necessarily covered all of them. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. I make a lot of non-voiceover content on this channel about TV shows, movies, games, and anything else I want to talk about. Making this video was a bit of a risk. I honestly have no idea if people will care about movie credit logos, but it's something that I find quite interesting, so I thought I'd make a video about it regardless. If you have any ideas for something you'd like me to cover on this channel, please let me know, and I'll see you next time.